They then move into their sessile state in the adult brain where they're more sitting and monitoring, okay? So they exist apart, as I uh, mentioned, from the neuronal circuits. They're restified, ramified is really the, the correct term for resting microglia. Uh, and they are searching their environment constantly, doing little repair work, cleanup work on the dendrites and neurons in the region. So they maintain the integrity of the CNS circuitry and are in their resting state. They can potentially influence information processing in the central nervous system, either indirectly via their interactions with astrocytes or directly by, main, uh, by interacting with synapses. The other thing that's interesting about microglia is they kind of have their own territories. So whereas there's clear uh, communication that occurs between astrocytes and there's communication that seems to occur between astrocytes to microglia, we have not yet identified any communication system where microglia communicate specifically with the astrocytes in reverse. So microglia move in and out of the system. They have huge functional plasticity. These guys are chameleons. They move from their ramified state, they can transform all the way into a macrophage. They have low thresholds of activation, so they move into action fairly quickly after there's any trauma uh, that occurs within the central nervous system. Uh, rapidly respond to uh, CNS pathology, and there's a graded response to their environment. The level of plasticity of these things, what they're capable of sensing, and what they're capable of responding to is absolutely astonishing. So this is a cartoon uh, of microglia, and what you're looking at here is the ramified form of the microglia, the resting state of the microglia, lots of little branches, and then what happens is when they become activated, they start to thicken those processes and that's when their biochemical factory starts firing up and they become amoeboid. They now start moving through uh, the neuronal tissue. They can eventually, in extreme situations, move all the way into the macrophage stage where they're actually engulfing bacteria and viruses and destroying them. So these guys are capable of going from hanging out to macrophage with an amoeboid state in between. It's an astonishing level of plasticity for a cell in the human uh, nervous system in anywhere in the human body. This is fairly complex, but basically what I want to do is give you a sense of the receptors that these things are capable of secreting. Now, what happens is they're constantly sensing their environment. As the environment changes, they're capable of kicking out receptors onto their cell surface that is able to take information in. All right, now normally you take in a couple of pieces of information and you call it a day. These guys are capable of taking in a massive amount of different types of protein information. Right? Information comes into the cells via either partial proteins, they come into the cells as uh, molecules. All right? So you can have just calcium as a messenger or magnesium as a messenger. But you can also have interleukins uh, and cytokines as messengers. And so there's a bunch of stuff that helps bring this to move toward uh, uh, major histocompatibility uh, class one and two. Bring bring the cells to a point of activation where they will adhere to the damaged areas in the central nervous system so that they can begin to uh, affect repair and create a protective barrier around the region. Uh, there's a huge number of these type adhesion molecules that get secreted. Uh, and there are then responsive to inflammatory, both inflammatory and uh, anti-inflammatory interleukins within the system. Uh, there's just a large range of receptors that these guys are capable of excreting. And a particular importance that we need to pay attention to is they respond to opioids. And they respond to benzodiazepines, and they respond to marijuana. They secrete both type 1 type 2 marijuana receptors. It looks like the type 2 uh, cannabinoid receptors is actually more specific in terms of downregulation of pain. But it may be that uh, the uh, cannabinoid receptors on the microglia are the ways in which uh, uh, marijuana is useful in terms of chronic pain in individuals. These guys we're going to get back to because I think that that's creating problems for us in terms of what we're doing in treating patients. The other thing that happens is, all right, so you've got all of this information coming in that it's capable of taking out, and then these guys turn into these incredible factories that start kicking out all kinds of proteins that now start telling the environment neurons around the area to do things differently. So they kick out 
cytokines and they kick out chemokines in both inflammatory and anti-inflammatory. So the thing we have to be careful about is the presence of glia cells does not equal inflammation. All right, there are times when they're neuroprotective, there are times where they're macrophages, okay? There are times when they're neuroregenerative and other times where they're neurodegenerative uh, as a result of the inflammatory processes. So there's a very sophisticated wide range of responses that these guys can go through. Uh, we see that they're capable of secreting brain-derived neuro, uh, nerve growth factors and uh, fibroblast growth factors. Amyloid uh, precursor protein, okay? So these guys have been associated with uh, Alzheimer's disease. And they're seen active in a wide range of neurodegenerative conditions. And for a while, it was thought that they may actually have been the cause of the problem. It now looks like they're probably protective in the situation uh, and just bystanders in, this, in, in the disease process, not the cause of the disease process itself. So surface markers, over 35 have been identified. Think about this. This little guy can excrete up to 35 or more surface markers that it can respond to. And remember that those surface markers, it's not one marker comes in and you get a single response. It's a gradation of those markers uh, that are stimulated that causes a gradation in terms of the production of the secretory products. And it kicks out something over 30 different secretory processes uh, that the microglia are able to do. This allows them to have a huge range of activity, as I said, both neuroregenerative, neurodegenerative, uh, and neuroprotective. And these are the major functions of these guys. So what turns them on? Almost everything. Psychological and physical trauma, stress, post-traumatic stress syndrome, will turn on microglia. Hypoxia, ischemia, so we see them going on in strokes. Neurodegenerative diseases, we see them activated in Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis, and AIDS-related dementia. We know that infections can turn them on. So, and the infections don't have to be in the central nervous system. The infections can be in the peripheral nerve, in the peripheral system, that is, systemically in our bodies. And because of crosstalk that occurs over the blood-brain barrier, the central nervous system macrophages, microglia, get turned on and become activated. So toxins, lead, and diesel fume, okay? These are proven. These are not hypothetical. These are proven all to cause activation and inflammatory responses um, in the microglia. Uh, 